Taylor, so you know a little bit about it already, but there's a couple named Kyle and Tori Breyer. And they're this normal Midwestern couple who live on a farm in small town Kansas. And they were high school sweethearts, then they got married. But as soon as they got married, they started realizing they were struggling with infertility. And after struggling for a while to try to conceive, eventually they start praying. And they say in the movie, we prayed to God, we prayed to the universe, to whoever would listen, please give us a baby. And then one day in a seemingly supernatural event, something that looks like a meteorite busts through the earth's atmosphere, crashes to the ground in the woods nearby their farmhouse. And so they travel out in the night into the woods and they go and they find that it's not a meteor, it's this small alien vessel, a spaceship if you will, and inside of it is a baby boy. And so this child's struggling, uh, he can barely breathe, so they take him in, take care of him, and eventually just begin to raise him. Now, if you're keeping up with the story so far, I mean, we haven't gotten far, but we have a baby boy from another planet. He crash lands to the earth like a meteorite in small town Kansas, and he's found and raised on a farm by a couple who are having trouble conceiving a child. What story does this sound like? Superman. It's the story of Kal-El. You know, it's the story of Clark Kent, basically, and Jonathan and Martha Kent finding this boy in a crater, you know, and, and raising him to be Clark Kent, his adoptive name, a.k.a. Superman. So they even in this film, the way they almost alliterate Clark Kent, uh, they make the boy's name Brandon Breyer. And so just lots of little parallelisms throughout the film. So it's obvious throughout the film uh, by the way, it's different because there's Smallville, Kansas. You know, there's a series named Smallville, and the name of the little town in Kansas here is Brightburn. And so that's the name of the film is based on the small Kansas town. So it's obvious throughout the film that the father, uh, he has a loving relationship with his adopted alien son. He has this loving relationship, but he's also cautious. It's like he has a respect for the fact that he knows that this kid is alien. That he doesn't know where this kid is from, so therefore he struggles with the question, who will this kid turn out to be? Like they have a loving relationship, but that's always in the back of his mind, so he's cautious. At the end of the day, truth be told, he's madly in love with his wife, and he'll do anything for her, even if it means bringing in this alien child to raise in their home. He does it for his wife. So he wants to love his wife, probably because he was engaged to Pam from the office and he treated her like crap and she dumped him for Jim. And so he's trying to get this one right. Do you recognize him for the the office fans, Netflix? All right, so the mom, on the other hand, is such a mom. She is such a mom and she is like, you were put on the earth for a reason and you're special, and you're going to do incredible things. And she's such a mom. She just loves them no matter what. Well, fast forward 12 years into the future, and Brandon Breyer, as he has now been named, his adoptive name, is now in middle school. And he's at that awkward phase where things are beginning to change biologically for him. But the only story that he knows is that he's adopted. He doesn't know anything about any space stuff or whatever. So there's a scene in the movie where Brandon goes to mow the lawn one day when he's 12 and he, he's yanking the cord to start the lawnmower and it won't start. He's like, stupid thing. And he gets angry uh, and he pulls it and he throws the lawnmower accidentally like a tenth of a mile down their farmyard, you know. And they're like, whoa. And so he walks up to the lawnmower, which is half wrecked, but it did start and the blade's spinning and he walks up to it and you can see this curiosity in his face. And he looks at his hand and he looks at the spinning blade, and he reaches his hand into the blade. Children, don't try this at home. He reaches into the blade, and the blade, the metal blade, just gets wrecked and destroyed, but he pulls out his hand, and it's just not damaged at all. It's not cut. It's not anything, and and his hand's completely fine. So then we go on a journey with Brandon Breyer. It's a journey of discovery to find out that he has all the same or mostly the same gifts as Superman. 
I mean, he has super speed, super strength. Bullets don't hurt him. He can fly as laser vision can cut things through with lasers from his eyes. And so we quickly see, though, that he's using these powers, these gifts that he has, not to help people with his gifts, but to help himself with the gifts. And, and so he uses these gifts not to serve others. There's this general code among superheroes, right? Like when you discover that you're bitten by a radioactive spider, okay, how do I use this? Because with great power comes great responsibility, Uncle Ben says. So how do I use this to serve others? There's this unwritten code among superheroes. I have been given gifts. How do I use them to serve? But that's not the route he goes. And, and we see him serving himself with these gifts. He uses them just simply to spy at times and to be creepy. Other times he, he covers his tracks. He even, he even hurts people. And, and, and when people betray him, he quickly becomes very comfortable with taking out revenge on others and using his powers to, to, to get revenge and to hurt and sometimes kill. And so he begins to daydream about evil and, and he begins to lie. He begins to threaten others and to hide and to cover up and to harm and even describes himself eventually as special and superior and so all this it takes this very very dark turn and after we see some examples of him being really disobedient disrespectful and and, and uh, man just like man this kid is making wrong choices he's malevolent and his dad kyle he privately tells the mom he says here's the deal he may look like us he may sound like us but he's never bled like not once in his whole life, he's never been cut, never broken a bone, never had a bruise, and now he's hurting people. Like this is going south, and it's going south quickly. Well, eventually, we see a scene that's kind of alluded to in the trailer where Brandon is, he, he's levitating above the place where his spaceship is hidden in the barn, and he doesn't know what's in there, but he keeps being drawn to it like gravity, just pulling him like a tractor beam, and he's levitating above it, and the ship keeps trying to communicate with him in an alien tongue. And it's his original tongue where he's from. It's like his native tongue, but he doesn't know it. So he keeps trying to decipher, what is the ship saying to me? Chikaro, Chika Chikaro, Chikaro means take. And then he slowly pieces together the next few words. Ch Chikaro means take, take the. And then there's another word that's given to him. Take the world. And that becomes his mission. He chooses to use his gifts for selfish reasons and not to serve others. And the message that he gets from his own spaceship is take the world. And that becomes a selfish, destructive mission that the film is built on as he attempts to do that with the powers that he's been given. Now the film was produced by, by James Gunn, who some of you recognize that name because he wrote and directed both of the Guardians of the Galaxy movie movies. So he's been handed a franchise of Marvel. Now he's been given the keys to, I don't know if you know, Suicide Squad. And they've given him this, I know they've given him the keys so much so that he's like recasting half the crew and all that stuff. So this is like major superhero dude, nerd, all that stuff. Well, he's like the director, producer, whatever. And he says about Brightburn, he says it's a superhero origin story about a kid that doesn't necessarily become a superhero. Perhaps he just becomes a monster. And so basically it's a new genre. It's like superhero blended with sci-fi, blended with horror. And so you really, you could call it a new genre. It's kind of like hero horror. This kid's been given gifts, superpowers, but he uses them for selfish gain. And, and the actress Elizabeth Banks, who plays the mom, she said, we always assume that these heroes are here for good, and that if we just love them and worship them, that they're going to help us as humans. But the film asks, what if they don't? And so that's basically the premise of this film, I love that one of the creators of the film uh, basically uh, says that this film plays with the question, what if Superman was Damien from the Omen? Like, <laughs> what if you took this kid who chooses this kind of evil, but he has the gifts to really exact punishment and revenge and selfish gain? So turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Like I said, House Bibles, page 927. Uh, and so today we're just going to beeline toward the point here, and we're going to talk about six truths about your gifts, all right? 
And so six truths about your gifts, and we're going to start in 1 Corinthians 7. The first truth is this. Your gifts are a gift. All right? Just plain and simple. Your gifts are given to you by God. They're called gifts for a reason. You know, when we say that someone is gifted, we don't mean, obviously, that they're superior. We mean that they've been blessed by their maker. We mean that they've been blessed by their creator with some special ability, something that's unique, something that they're good at that not everyone around them is. And yeah, you have to work hard to develop them, but they're still gifts. 1 Corinthians 7, 7 says this, each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. So these are gifts given to you by God. In this book, Entre Leadership, which is like a combo word of entrepreneur and leadership. Dave Ramsey, the, uh, the finance guru, uh, this is a leadership book he wrote, and he says, your talent is God's gift to you. What you do with it is your gift back to God. Don't just be a trim carpenter. Like, think more deeply about your skill. Don't just be a trim carpenter. Be an artisan. Like, say, whatever I do, I'm going to do it with excellence for God because he's gifted me with this. So I want to give gifts back to him with how I use it. So the more gifted you are, the more thankful and humble and appreciative you you should be. We have some really gifted people at Momentum. I mean really gifted. I'm talking to a bunch of them right now, and I know some of you are going to kind of dodge that. But the truth is, we have such gifted people at Momentum. And and, and here's the, the temptation is when you forget that your gifts, your talents are gifts from God, Sometimes people begin to think that they are the gift to humanity. Like, I am God's gift to people. You know, I do this thing. And and a lot of times it's subtle, but it's in our attitudes and it's in some of the ways that our motives come out that we realize this. I mean, some of you know, if you're honest, you have the capacity to be the Antonio Brown in your office. (laughs) Some of you know you have the capacity to be the Antonio Brown on your soccer team or in your class. You have that capacity. To, to, I mean, and the irony of that is that is just someone becoming an arrogant diva because of something that's been given, gifted to them. Like, you have special ability, and you develop that special ability, sure. But the truth is you've been gifted this thing. D- don't become like Brandon Breyer because it's easy to start thinking when you are really good at something that you are special and that you're superior, especially when it's people who do the same thing as you, when they're gifted at the same thing. It's easy to start competing and to start thinking you're superior to the people who have the same gifts. So don't forget your gifts are a gift. Number two, God sent you to earth with at least one gift. Now I have to emphasize this because there's always the percentage of people when I talk to a crowd who are like, yeah, but I don't have anything. I don't have nothing, Dan. Other people are gifted, not me. This message isn't for me at all. And I would just simply respond in the godliest way, bull. Like bull. That's bull. Like hush your mouth, Eugene. That is not the case. Everyone has at least one gift. 1 Corinthians 7, 7. Back to that. Each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift. Another has that. Now Paul, the leader who wrote this letter, it's a letter to Christians in a city in the first century called Corinth. So that's why the letter is called Corinthians, like writing to Ohioans in Ohio. This is Corinthians. He's writing to the church in Corinth saying, man, each of you in the church, talking specifically to these Christians, has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Jesus tells a story one time called the parable of the talents. And in that story, there's a master, a fictional master, but it represents Jesus, and and that master gives one person one talent, another person two talents, another person five talents. So different people do have different amounts of gifts, but the truth is, as you you know as well as I do, sometimes that person with one talent that hones in on that one talent is better than the person who has five talents. Sometimes. Sometimes the person with five talents is crazy gifted at three, four, five of them, just like next level. And at the end of that story, I think one of the guys ends up with 11 talents that God has gifted him with. And so some people have a lot of things that they're good at. Others are like, man, I'm a one-trick pony, but I love that thing. I hone, I'm passionate about that thing. But everyone has a gift. You can't dodge that. God has given you a gift, at least one. Number three, you don't get to choose your gifts, God does. This sucks, doesn't it? 
This sucks. I mean, it really does. Because so many of you want to be singers, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, so many people are like, I, I want to sing. I want to sing lovely. The acoustics in the shower are beautiful, and I still suck. You know, like, I just don't sound good. And God still wants you to sing to him. He doesn't care if you have skills singing to him in worship. But if you're like, I want to be a singer, I'm going to spend all my time training to be a singer. But people who are honest and love you around you are telling you, what some people should have told people who went on American Idol. Yeah. You know, like everybody in American Idol has a grandma telling them they're the best singer in the world. They're like an angel. And then they show up and, you know, they show that they're not on television in front of everybody. You're like, oh, someone, they just needed a friend to tell them that their singing is not their thing. But if you are like, man, I want to sing, and, and you just realize, but that's not my thing, man, that's awesome. Go to karaoke on Thursday nights. Love it, have fun with it, but work on discovering what did God really gift you to do. Like there's something you're going to be excellent at, but you've got to find that thing. As much as you wish it was one thing, you don't get to choose your gift, God does. I want to be a professional athlete. I do too. I do too. But I'm older than Tom Brady up in here, okay? I'm not going to be, I mean, I got the skills, it's just the age, that's the only obstacle, <laughs> You know, but, you know, play college intramurals, play co-ed softball, but find what really is your gift. Have fun with that thing, playing around, but if that's not your gift. Find your gift. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 and 11 says this. There are different kinds of gifts. God's Spirit distributes them to each one just as He determines. Like, so God's like, okay, I'm going to give you this, I'm going to give you this and this. And God, his spirit, is the one who distributes the gifts among his church. And unfortunately, we don't get to choose. Number four, your natural gifts can become spiritual gifts. Now, there are different theories. In, 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 in Scripture, spiritual gifts are talked about a lot. And, and there are some different theories on what truly is a spiritual gift. And I honestly think some of these theories overlap, and, and a few of them are true. But I'm going to share two of them with you. One is that I think we see an example in Scripture that sometimes spiritual, or spiritual gifts are given to you by God when you become a follower of Jesus. Okay, so there are people that become a follower of Jesus and they end up with gifts that they really didn't have pre-Jesus. And they start to develop those gifts and recognize those gifts and people identify them in them. And they're like, man, that's, that's really cool. But I think also another uh, fact is true, and that is I think also spiritual gifts often really can just be any gift that you have used for spiritual purposes like to say okay i have this gift to do this thing and it seems so mundane it seems like such a small thing but when you repurpose this talent the skill this gift that you have and you use it for spiritual purposes i believe that's a spiritual gift i mean some of the spiritual gifts listed in first corinthians 12 and romans 12 in scripture aren't super sexy things but they're very important spiritual gifts they're called like the gift of administration the gift of helping people like stuff like that. the gift of generosity okay the singing isn't even mentioned in the spiritual gifts i don't think that means it's not one i don't think those lists are extensive or exclusive but i just think you can use gifts that you have for spiritual purposes and they become spiritual gifts An example of this back in the original 1978 film superman christopher reeves 1978 um, Superman, you know, Kal-El meteorite, basically, spaceship to the earth, crater, old couple that never were able to have children find this child. And they're basically fixing like a broken tire or a flat on their truck. And they're talking about this baby that they've just found. And, and Martha, the, the mom that's going to become the adoptive mom, is like, let's take him home. Let's, let's raise him. We'll say he's in town from cousin so-and-so and, -so and we're caring for him, blah, blah, blah. And the dad's like, I don't know. Are you sure about that? And, and while that's happening, like the truck falls off the jack or the truck begins to fall and, and could kill the, the father. But baby Kal-El, in his strength, renowned scene, catches the car and in his super strength, holds the car up like in his like cloth diaper, you know? He like holds it up or whatever and keeps it from falling, saves the life of his adoptive father. Now parallel that because there's all these small parallels in Brightburn. In Brightburn, we see Brandon Breyer lift a truck in the air without even using his hands. He just uses his powers to levitate this truck in the air and he uses it to kill 
a family member. He uses it to lift in the air and drop it to kill someone. And you're like, whoa, it's kind of the same thing if you put it together. It's like Superman, there's this renowned picture from the movie of him lifting a truck, baby, to save people. Here, the same power is being used to kill, to hurt, for selfish purposes. Now, it's pretty obvious. There are many gifts that can be used for either good or evil. Okay, that's pretty basic. I mean, there are some, very rarely, there are some things that there's no, there's just no redeeming purpose for that, you know. There's just so I can't be a porn star for Jesus. You know, there's just all these things that says it's not going to work out. These are awkward things. Those aren't going to happen, okay. But there are a lot of things, most things you're like, wow, I could use this for good or evil. Many of the same gifts can. Most of those things can be recycled and used to serve Jesus, I mean, you think back to like Liam Neeson, speaking of movies, Taken. I don't have money, but what I do have is a particular set of skills. You know, like in that thing, he's like, uh, what? He's a bad dude that was trained by the government to hunt down, you know, whatever people. And he uses it for good in that movie because his daughter has been taken. And he's trying to keep her from being sold into sex slavery. And so he's like, I've got this particular set of skills. I'm going to use these for good now. And I'm going to wreck faces and cars and buildings to rescue my daughter. And he uses it for good. Yeah, l- last week, my buddy Josh Kayser, who plays bass in the band this morning, told me about a, a podcast, a story he heard in a podcast. Uh, it's, a, it's a podcast called Voice of Martyrs. And I asked him to send it to me, but it was about this guy who's serving Jesus and telling Muslims about Jesus um, in the Islamic Republic of Iran. And it's just this, this courageous, bold story. And for security reasons, they have to call the guy Ali as a fake name, and they disguise his voice a little bit in the podcast. Um, but even though Iran doesn't allow religious freedom, this guy, Ali, says, man, God is moving nonetheless you know, in this place where it's hostile for you to know, follow, or talk about Jesus. But he says, man, this is a hot spot for God's activity right now in Iran. This dude says back when, he tells his own story, he says back when I was 16, I used to be a drug dealer. He said, I used to make ecstasy. I used to sell ecstasy. I used to throw underground parties called raves. He said, so I used to do that all in a Western country. Like, I didn't grow up here in Iran. I did this in a Western country. He said, I was basically criminally minded for years, and, and I used burner phones, phones you use like one time, you know, done with them, throw them away. And so, I mean, here's what's up. To throw a rave, you need to be able to communicate secretly. You need to be able to tell everybody where the thing's going to be at, the rave, when, what time it will happen. You have to do this all without authorities figuring out what you're saying, and you need to have a location that's secure and have people looking out for the authorities in case they come. I mean, you need a, a map point, and you say, here's the map point that we will send people to. And they'll send text messages out to everyone, say, here's the map point, and the map point is where you go to get the map. So you show up there, and they vet you to make sure you're not PD, and then if you're not PD, they give you a map that takes you to the real location. And so all this stuff goes down, and, and basically Ali says, understanding how to evade police officers and, and throw events under the radar since I've become a follower of Jesus has all been recycled and redeemed or taken back or bought back by Jesus for Christ inside Iran. He said, I'm now criminally minded for Jesus, basically. He said, inside of Iran, and I'm using the same concepts. He says, to have secret meetings and underground gatherings for church, for God's glory. He said, it's amazing that I can say this. It's like, he said, I had on-the-job training for years on how to do all this stuff that I'm doing right now inside of Iran. And all those things he did to put on a rave back in the day, back when he was the old Ali, I used those same skill sets to have secret house church and secret gatherings for 80 people in Iran. And, And God is in the business of taking these things, you're like, ah, oh, it's just a skill I had, you know, you don't need to know. It's just a skill I had, it's a talent, it's a gift I had. You can use those things creatively to say, how can I use that for God's glory? How can I use that for good? You know, I can either, I can either lift trucks off people and rescue people, or I can drop trucks on people with my gift. I can use it for selfish purposes, I can use it to serve self, or I can use it to serve God and others. 
those things can be redeemed and used as spiritual gifts. Storytelling can be your spiritual gift. The gift of humor can be your spiritual gift. Knowing how to throw a good party, that can be redeemed to be a spiritual gift. Health and fitness stuff can be a spiritual gift. Photography, playing baseball, knowing how to put together a good budget, being able to change the brakes on a car can be redeemed and used as spiritual gifts if you use that gift to honor God and say, I'm not just going to use it for self. I'm going to use this to serve God and serve others. Number five, your gift must be developed. Okay, I know there's some superhero word, worlds where someone receives a gift and they never have to work on burning through a metal wall with their laser vision, you know. They don't have to work on it. Other films, people have to develop, you know, go web go, and they're working on figuring out how to use their powers and they have to develop it. But we have gifts that have to be developed. First century Christian mentor, Christian leader named Paul, tells this to his disciple, his spiritual son, if you will, Timothy. It's like he just adopted him to be a spiritual son. He says, do not neglect your gift, Timothy. Like, you have gifts. Be sure not to neglect them. I mean, parenthetically, because if you neglect them, they'll go away. If you neglect them and bury them and sit on these talents, they will disappear. Do not neglect your gifts, Timothy. And then he goes on in the next letter. This is a letter from Paul to Timothy, just instructing him on leadership and how to follow Jesus. First Timothy, it's called. Then the next letter, Second Timothy, he says, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. This is such a cool verse. It's basically saying, okay, you fan a weak flame or an ember, and, and, and when you do that, it, it, it puts oxygen in there. It feeds oxygen by blowing fresh air into the fire, and that helps the fire burn hotter, more intense, to grow, to be stronger. And so when God gives us a gift, when God gives you a gift, they're not automatically, immediately in full blaze. They're just not. He gives you embers. He gives you small flames, and he says, okay, now you fan the flame into this gift of God that I've given you, you fan it, you develop it, don't neglect it. Build that up and let that become something bigger and develop that into, if you will, a bright burn. Just develop it into this blaze because it has potential to be very, very large, very strong, very powerful. And momentum wants to move you forward with your skills, with your talents to love God, love people, and make disciples who make disciples. Don't neglect your gift. Fan the flame so that your gifts will grow and develop those gifts. Gifts are often given to us at a five or a six, you know, and you have to develop them as a five out of ten and say, okay, I think I have potential. People have recognized potential in me. You know, people are honest around me in my Mo group, for instance, to tell me, I don't know that that is your gift, sweetie. You know, I, in love, in love, but in truth, I don't know that, that is your gift, sweetie. But They've recognized that there is something, maybe potential. So when you develop them, maybe you end up being an eight. Maybe you end up being a nine. Some of you might be a 10 at some things and, and, and an eight at other things. 40 years ago, there was a research paper done in a magazine that still exists called uh, American Scientist. And two guys, Herbert Simon and William Chase, drew a famous conclusion in the study where they studied experts on things. So they studied expertise. And, and this is their, part of their conclusion in their research paper said this, there are no instant experts, for instance, in chess, certainly no instant masters or grandmasters. There appears not to be on record any case where a person reached grandmaster level with less than about a decade's intense preoccupation with the game. They said we could estimate, we would estimate very roughly that a master has spent perhaps 10,000 to 50,000 hours staring at chess positions. So, I mean, this is the amount of time and effort that people put into something to be really extremely good at it. And in the years that followed, an entire field within psychology grew up out of this paper. People being fascinated with the research they had done said, let's study this more. And they started studying classical composers and all different kinds of experts in different fields with different gifts. And, and basically researchers continually landed on the same conclusion that it takes a lot of practice to be good at a complex task. You have to fan the flame 
that God has put inside of you for it to grow. Don't neglect it or it will fizzle, it will shrink, it will go away and that flame may die out. In fact, famously in 2008, an author that I love, not a Christian guy or anything like that, he used to write for the New Yorker, he writes books uh, like Blink and like David and Goliath, but one of the books he wrote in 2008, Malcolm Gladwell, he wrote a book called Outliers. And it's basically, he's a best-selling author, and he talks about this principle that those guys wrote about 40 years ago, and he calls it the 10,000-hour rule. Like, if you want to be exceptional at something, you need to set your eyes on the 10,000-hour rule. Like, I'm going to continue to pour into this practice, 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 fan the flame, develop my gift, don't neglect my gift until I see this ember become a full blaze. Gladwell writes, no one succeeds at a high level without innate talent, but achievement is talent plus preparation. You have to fan the flame. I remember uh, I was listening to an audiobook last year where someone kind of highlighted as an example John Williams, the famous composer. He creates these incredible scores for Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Harry Potter. I mean, you just go down the list. 1978 film I referenced earlier, Superman, John Williams. I mean, all these incredible scores that he's created. And I remember hearing him, John Williams, talk about this incredible, gifted. He said, I have to write every day. Even if it's just for a few minutes, I force myself to write every day. And sometimes I get done writing and I'm like, that was terrible. What I just wrote was terrible, but I have to keep exercising it, writing every day. And then sometimes there's a breakthrough. Oh my gosh, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. But many days, that was crap. That was 10 to 15 minutes waste. That was crap. But he makes himself write every day. He fans the flame. If you want to play guitar and help people lead worship in a worship band, you got to say, I'm going to play the guitar every day. If you already play in a worship band and guitar, you say, man, I got to keep growing. I got to fan the flame. I got to keep, make sure I don't neglect this gift or, or just show up unprepared. I'm going to fan the flame and keep growing, even if it's just for 10 or 15 minutes on some days. If you want to write books or, or preach sermons, you have to write a little bit every day. You have to fan the flame that God has given you. If you want to be a historian or a lawyer, you need to re read a little bit of history every day, at least a little bit of history. If you want to be a doctor, you need to study a little bit of biology, at least a little bit, every day. If you want to be a master chef, like Adam Smith, who jumps during scary trailers, <laughs> you're not going to direct horror films, but you're gifted at cooking. You're going to be a chef, all right? And so you have to cook a little bit every day. And, and no one just steps on stage and rips a dope freestyle. No, they don't, okay? Just mo most of them are written anyways in advance. Everything that rappers are putting out, calling it a freestyle, it's not. It's pre-written and memorized. It's clear. It's obvious. And when it is a freestyle, most of it sucks. That's just the truth of the hip-hop culture. But no one just gets on stage and rips a freestyle. They play with words constantly. Every day they're thinking about words, crossword puzzles, how they match together, how phonetically this fits and how this ending isn't the same ending, but it's a slant rhyme with this word. And they play with it all the time. I mean, you don't, no one just walks into an OR and does world-class neurosurgery. It's preparation. It's fanning the flame. It's like, I want to have a laser focus. I've got other things that are important priorities in my life, my, my walk with God, my family, whatever, but I need to find even a little bit of time a day just to pour into this, the, the 10,000 hour rule. Fan the flame of the gift that God has given you. And six, and finally, your gifts are given to you to serve the church and to serve others. If you follow Jesus, your spiritual gifts are given to you to serve the church and to serve others. So this is where we really hone in on our tendency to be like Brandon B Breyer, even in small ways. You know, like Brandon Breyer, you can use your gifts to serve yourself, or you can use them to serve others, and ultimately God. You can use them to serve self, or to serve others. And your gifts aren't like Brandon Breyer, this is more the extreme, but, but you, obviously your gifts aren't to use, to be taken revenge on others, to hurt others, to get girls to like you. These are the obvious things from the movie. Like, okay, I'm not just going to use these gifts for that purpose. But then there are other things that aren't so obvious about how we serve ourselves with our gifts. I mean, I would say your gifts aren't only for these things, although these things aren't bad in themselves. Your gifts aren't only for your enjoyment. They are only for your hobby time. They are only to help you relax or to make a living for yourself or to provide for your family or to live 
comfortably or to get rich or to, to acquire lots of fans or to acquire lots of followers or to get famous. None of those things in and of themselves is wrong until you make them the goal. If, if, if your gift is just about providing for your family, then yeah, it's a little bit off. It's, so, it's a good thing, but it's a good thing that's made an ultimate thing that it was not meant to be. You've been given a gift from God. They're used to gift back to God and to gift to others. You've been given a gift so you can gift it to others. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 and 7 says this. There are different kinds of gifts. Now to each one, the manifestation of that gift, how that sh gift shows up, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Okay, so speaking to Christians, he says, you have been given a gift, but don't get it twisted. This gift isn't just for you. It isn't for like, oh man, I love to do this thing, photography, so on my time, on my day off, I will go and do photography. It's my thing that I enjoy. I unplug to relax. He's saying, no, if you've been given a gift, it's given for the common good. It's for the good of all, that means. Your gift, my gift, is for the good of all. It's not just something that I do to make a career, to put food on the table, or to enjoy myself. It's given for mutual edification. It means we all use our gifts to build each other up, to help each other move forward spiritually, to encourage each other, to challenge each other, to stretch each other, to inspire each other. Like, whoa, check that out. The way they're serving, using their gifts. It inspires one another. Brandon Breyer specially gifted his gifts they, he, he never realizes these aren't for me take the world these aren't for me they're for me they're not for others they're for me to use for selfish purposes instead of helping people he was helping himself so your gifts are a gift but they're meant to be given away multiple times in scripture paul that christian leader uses an analogy for us uses an analogy for the church, the body of Christ as a body, a human body. He says, okay, Jesus is the head, okay, metaphorically, and he uses the metaphor in different ways. But he basically says all of us are body parts. We all have our own function. And it's this cool picture because if you think about it, it's unified diversity. We, we all aren't the same. We don't have to be the same, but we're unified in our diversity. Whether it's background, whether it's ethnicity, race, and spiritual gifts, we are unified diversity. And he said the cool thing about that is you got an eye who contributes the gift of sight, an ear who contributes the gift of hearing. You got a foot who helps the body move forward. You got a hand who can work and get its fingernails dirty. And the whole body works together and is unified. But the whole body needs all of these parts. Like every part is needed. I mean, if you look through this week, I did this for this week in the NFL. I looked through the NFL injury list, like across the league. You can find, you know, websites. Here's everyone injured in the NFL. And they'll tell you what's their status coming up for Sunday or Monday. It's either doubtful, questionable, probable, or they're out, you know, whatever. And so you go through, and it's funny, all these stud bodies, all these fast, powerful, strong dudes, often it's one body part, and they're out of the game. Okay, I looked through the list, and under type, for type of injury, there was wrist, finger, someone's finger is hurt, and they're not playing in the NFL. Calf, hamstring, hip, neck, ankle, back, knee, shoulder, foot, collarbone, Achilles, that's a bad one, groin, oh, that's a really bad one, <laughs> pectoral, lung, kidney, hernia, toe. This one always, this one always cracks me up. Toe, a toe will keep a grown man with pectorals the size of human heads fast i mean it can run faster than my car going down turny it'll keep a dude out there's an injury as many of you know called turf toe okay turf toe keeps people out of games for weeks why because one body part is injured one body part can't function the way it should so the whole body is held back and paul says that first corinthians 12 if one part suffers every part suffers with it not only is that a truth but i feel like it's also a command if, if one body part suffers, there's a tragedy, for instance, in the black community, then the whole church should rally around and be like, that is part of the body of Christ. We rally, everyone suffers when someone suffers. And, and so it's this way to say, man, when one part is down for the count, it can keep us all out of the game, functioning the way we're supposed to function. 1 Corinthians 12, 22, same chapter, Paul says, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker 
are indispensable. So for those of you dodging the whole thing about you have at least one gift, ah, oh, my, my thing, it's so humble. It's so behind the scenes. All I do is bake. All I do is this. All I do is whatever. You're indispensable to the body of Christ. For us to function and be the hands and feet of Jesus in the community, the way that we want to be, we're held back. We're on the injury list. If you don't use that gift in a redeemable way for Jesus and say, I can't just serve myself, I can't just serve my family with this gift, I have to serve the common good, I have to serve all with this gift. It's been given to me to contribute to the church. Every part of the human body matters. Now there's always, in every church, there's that one guy that's like the appendix. No one really knows what this dude does to function, and he might just blow up and kill us all. I mean, there's one of those in every, in every church. But for the most part, it, and also here's this, here's a big sign of maturity. And it, it's a subtle thing. But sometimes when we start off maturing and how we think and talk about our gifts and serving, sometimes we say things that show we still have a little bit ways to go when it comes to serving and growing in our maturity of how we serve. And you'll hear people say things like, it's not wrong, it's just early in the stage. They'll say, man, I love to serve the kids back in Mo Kids. It makes me feel so good to invest in those kids. Okay, I, I love serving high school students. I get so much out of serving those middle schoolers or high schoolers on Sunday night or leading a, a small group or whatever it is. I get so much out of that. It really makes me feel good about myself when I get to play in the worship band. And, and the focus is really on how does that make me feel? Does it give me like a little bit of a buzz to be able to serve? When really ultimately it comes down to saying, man, I, I want to be like Jesus who, as an example, the God of our universe shows us that our God is a servant-hearted God. And he comes to earth to wash dirty feet and to lay down his life on a cross and give his life as a ransom for people. That's the kind of God I serve. He wants to serve, not because he gets anything out of it, but because he wants to sacrifice for the good of others, for the common good. I, we had this Mo Kids Warp Zone a few months ago. And it just basically means a way to train Warp Zone, uh, to train Mo Kids volunteers. Just kind of Warp Zone them ahead a little bit, like Mario Brothers. Warp Zone them ahead a little bit, help them jump forward in their volunteerism and leadership back in Mo Kids. And I remember Nicole Gates, who leads Mo Kids here at Garfield Heights Campus, and Lauren Love, who leads at the other campus, Twinsburg, Macedonia. Um, they asked people there, hey, why do you serve in Mo Kids? And one of the most mature answers came from a lady named uh, Ashley Bachna, who had just recently been baptized. And she said, man, I got to be honest, the reason I serve is because not long ago, I showed up at church and someone took my babies and they took them into Mo Kids and they invested in them. They taught them about Jesus. And meanwhile, I got to hear the good news about God sending Jesus to die for me, the gospel, we call it. And someone took care of my kids so that I could hear that message. Now... I serve in Mo Kids because I want to take babies from someone else and love those children, invest in those children, so someone else can hear the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus. And I was blown away. I was like, she just became a Christian, and that is a very mature step in how she looks at her reasoning to serve. Not just it makes me feel good, it gives me warm fuzzies, but I want to learn to sacrifice for the good of others. You know, Jesus teaches in Matthew 25 in that parable of the talents I mentioned that one of the most wicked things I can do as his follower is, is to refuse to invest in eternal things. To say, I have a talent, but I'm going to bury it, and I'm going to sit on it. And, and Jesus tells me, that's one of the most wicked things I could do with my life, is to not invest in eternal things that are for God's kingdom. Now, you might say, and I understand this response, but Dan, I don't preach, I don't sing, I don't do anything on the stage, I don't know a lot about the Bible, I don't know how to play any of those cool instruments David read about in Psalm 150, I don't know how to do any of that stuff, but you don't have to, there's so many different kinds of gifts, you just have to figure out, what are the things that I'm good at? What are the things that people remark about and say, wow, you're really good at that skill? Uh, you know, one example, I'll close with one more thing from Scripture. In the book of Exodus, while God's people, the Israelites at that time, are wandering around in the desert and they're being led by a God, godly dude named Moses, God gives elaborate instructions to Moses about something that he wants built by the Israelites. It's called the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle is really just a portable worship facility. 
We know something about portable worship facilities up in here, don't we? I mean, packing things up in a trailer, all that. We know about the tabernacle. They're going through the wilderness and the desert, setting up a portable facility to worship God and do all this kind of stuff. Well, God gives all these details in Exodus, several chapters, but in 31, he says this. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen, now once again, this is why you're happy to not be on stage and happy to have me on stage is to pronounce names like Bezalel, okay? See, I have chosen Bezalel of the tribe of Judah, and I've filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all the skills, kinds of skills to make artistic design for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. Moreover, I have appointed Aholiab. Man, that's the next kid right there. Name him. Aholiab. That's good stuff. Because he's from the tribe of Dan. I like that dude. <laughs> tribe of Dan. To help him. Also, I've given ability to all the skilled workers to make everything I've commanded you. So, he gave, like a craftsman, he gave an apprentice for that a craftsman, and then a bunch of skilled workers to help execute this plan. I've got to say, God does that in, in like every church. He doesn't miss a church where he's like, man, I forgot to give you skilled people that don't do stuff on stage. My bad. Because the backbone of momentum is often people like Robert Sties. The backbone of momentum or any church is often people like Jeremy Speth who are so skilled with their hands and sometimes are on stage maybe, but, but mostly are the backbone of the church. They're the spine in the body, man. They're, they're the spine. I mean, people like Heather Rink at the Twinsburg Macedonia campus, almost all of our equipment at Garfield Heights campus is packed into a trailer just outside this wall. We tear down, stack up chairs, wrap everything up, and then we take it and put it in this trailer, and usually everything goes to the threshold of that trailer. I mean, we pack it in there, okay? It's like Dan's minivan, just packed with children. And so we pack it in there, and we close it. Well, we recently had a cart break, wheel broke. It doesn't go in the same way, throws everything off. So we got a guy, Rob Clawson, who is running sound right now. Here's Rob and his beautiful family. And, and Rob is a handyman. He's good with a lot of stuff. He's good with computers. He's good with mathematics and problem solving, organization, and clearly, based on the trailer, Tetris okay he just knows how crap fits together and stuff and so on his own time he goes home and he thinks through our trailer packing issues we have a broken piece of equipment he gets on his computer creates a diagram gets a duct tape and he prints it off and puts it up on the side inside the trailer on the wall so that not just rob knows how to pack things in there when rob might not be here i mean this is a skill of a craftsman who's like I've got some skills that I can use, and I can use them for God's glory and make this a spiritual gift in how I use it. Isn't this awesome that someone say, I'm going to put the time and thought into God's church to be like, this kind of stuff's important, or no one gets to see football. We're just out there trying to fit things, and we're missing the Ravens-Kansas City game, and we're trying to fit things in there, and it doesn't fit. This is incredible. Uh, John Silvaggi is a gifted carpenter. Garfield Lights Campus, he's playing one of the guitars today, and uh, he's a gifted carpenter, and a few weeks ago in the summer, we didn't have a painter's easel on Saturday night. Me and Shannon were taking a walk, and uh, she was whispering sweet nothings to me. She was all over me. I'm like, get off me. I'm not a piece of meat, and so we're like talking. It's getting romantic, and all of a sudden, she's like, whoa, wait a minute. Mike Altman, the painter, is coming tomorrow. Do we have an easel? Because our easel had sat outside beside the building and got warped, and it was just like didn't work anymore. It was nasty. And we were like, we don't have an easel anymore at the Garfield Heights campus. They do at the other campus, but we don't anymore. Well, I asked John Silvaggi because he's this really gifted carpenter. He's a craftsman who helped build the tabernacle. And I'm like, dude, we need. And, and so he was like, okay, I'm going to take a lot of time, and I'm going to make this awesome. And look at this. This is our easel that we have. Brady's going to bring it out here too. This is the painter's easel that he just finished. I don't even know how all this crap works. Like stuff that goes together and you can adjust and you can fold it up and these fits in these slots. He burned the logo in there with gunpowder. Like for real. He lit it. It's about to get lit up in here. He lit it. He did this 10 times, burnt the logo in there. I was like, this is the most incredible easel I've ever seen. Like check out the back of this thing. Like back that thing up, you know? And like there, look at that. I mean, it's so nice. But he was like, I want to put extra thought into this and I, I, I just wanted to make you proud. And I was like, dude, you make God proud with this. Like, 
this is incredible. These guys are heroes. The spines of the body, so that frankly, I can stand up here on a stage that's been put together and talk about God, and other people can lead you in worship. That's what the church is about. It's a body of people who bake and organize and create budgets, and they paint, and they make things that people can paint on, and all this stuff comes together. Now, at the end, or in the movie, I'll just end with this. In the movie, I kind of gave a head fake to an ending earlier, didn't I? Sorry about that. I apologize. Like, hey, I'm going to wrap up with this. No, I got 10 more minutes. <laughs> just shut up and listen. All right? In the, in the movie Brightburn, uh, eventually something really bad happens, as you can imagine. Uh, and the dad suspects Brandon was behind it and is lying about it. And so the dad, okay, he says to the mom, he says, we have to do something or more people are going to get hurt. Like, they're going to get hurt, and they're going to die. He says, you've got to be with me on this. Now, remember, she's mom. She's like, he's gifted. He's sent for a purpose, all this stuff. And she says very protectively, I will never turn against our son. And it begins this conflict, and the dad says, he's not our son. He's something we found out in the woods. He's killing us. And, and there's this conflict that rises up. Now, I love that the actor in, like, a behind-the-scenes thing he says, man, as an actor, if I could give one piece of advice to my character that I play, if I could give one piece of advice to that character, my one piece of advice would be this one thing, we should have stopped it sooner. And I would say to you, some of you are so gifted and you're hiding behind excuses of schedule or I don't have any gifts or I don't know what they are and you're not really trying to find them or you have gifts and you're neglecting them and you're not fanning them or you have gifts but you're not giving them as gifts to God and others and you're hiding behind all these things and I'm telling you, one day you're going to go down the line and you're going to look back and say, I wish I would have recognized that and I wish I would have stopped it sooner. I've been so selfish for so long with the gifts that God's given me I wish I would have stopped it sooner. We are on the injury list if you don't contribute. Because when you contribute in the church, it means we get to be the hands and feet of Jesus out in the community. We get to handle business here and love and serve others in the name of Jesus because of your gifts and this unified diversity.